Coming up. So won't you help to see? It's an interview you don't want to miss. We're talking The Voice with Hawaiian singer Kamale Kava'a, who's turning heads this season. Plus, an indigenous-led library in Arizona is about to get a big boost. And in celebration of Women's History Month, hear about a woman named one of art's top 50 most influential people. Those interviews plus headlines are next on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Support for the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS Studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Thank you for joining us. I am Aliyah Chavez. We start today in California, where a tribal nation has become the first to manage tribal land with the National Park Service. In a historic memorandum of understanding, the Yurok tribe will be returned 125 acres of its original land to serve as a new gateway to Redwood National and State Parks. Aside from preserving and protecting the land, there are also plans for a traditional Yurok village and a sweat house. A new visitor and cultural center is also in the works, where it will be a hub for the tribe to carry out its traditions. A federal court ruling in Arizona of an Arizona copper mine is not deterring a group that holds the land sacred. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled this month in favor of Resolution Copper's plan for a mine at a location known as Oak Flat. Apache Stronghold, a nonprofit fighting the plan, is poised to file an appeal to the Supreme Court on April 15th. Leaders say the fight is bigger than Oak Flat. It's about the planet. We're talking about uh, sustainability. We're talking about uh, keeping life moving forward. And there has to be a time and place in which we're in now is that enough is enough. Moving to Alaska, the state's largest hospital is expanding. The Alaska Native Medical Center is undergoing a multi-year $257 million project to improve and expand emergency services. The hospital, which serves over 70,000 people, will get additional emergency department patient care spaces, surgery recovery bays, and behavioral health treatment spaces, among other things. According to the president of the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium and UP citizen Valerie Davidson, the expansion makes up for decades of underinvestment in infrastructure. Staying in the last frontier, the Alaska Federation of Natives is searching for its next president. Former AFN President Julie Kitka is stepping down after 33 years of service to the organization. AFN is the largest statewide organization in Alaska, serving 179 tribal nations and hundreds of village corporations. Its work helps solicit government program funds, operate education and training, and press forward land claims. The nonprofit's board of directors Directors hopes to fill the role by AFN's annual conference later this year. Well, it's a historic moment in the world of skiing. In Park City, Utah, Cheyenne Arapaho and Muscalero Apache skier Ross Anderson will make history as the first ever Native American to be inducted into the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. Anderson's skiing abilities, marked by his speed on the slopes, have earned him admiration and respect within the skiing community. In 2006, during a race in the French Alps, Anderson hit a staggering 154 miles per hour, a record no American skier has touched. It was seen as a landmark feat for both him and Native American representation in the sport. In Wisconsin, a state, a section of Interstate 90 is getting a new name. On Monday, Governor Tony Evers signed a bill to honor Ho-Chunk Code Talkers. The Ho-Chunk World War II Code Talkers Memorial Highway highlights 14 veterans. These men sent messages in their native language, which could not be deciphered by the enemy. There are believed to be at least 14 Native nations who served as Code Talkers in the Pacific and Europe, according to the National World War II Museum. Museum's website.
Our next guest has a name you'll want to remember. Kamale Kava'a is a native Hawaiian singer who has earned a spot competing on season 25 of NBC's The Voice. I spoke with him recently about this life-changing experience and about what it means to represent his people. Take a look. Kamale Kava'a, thank you so much for joining us on the ICT Newscast. Thank you for having me. Aloha. You are a contestant on season 25 of NBC's The Voice. How did your journey start? Uh, my journey started with my wife, actually. Um, my wife signed me up for the virtual auditions, uh, actually without me knowing. So, I mean, it, it was kind of a surprise to me, um, but she signed me up for it. Um, she encouraged me to do it and, and to, to try it because it was really something that I... I was a little too too shy, a little too nervous to do. Um, so she pushed me to do it. And um, here we are today, um, sitting here in this interview. Um, and, and so many great things has, hap has happened since that moment. You first caught the attention of the judges at your blind audition when you sang Bob Marley's Redemption song. Take us through that song decision. With the song, especially for my blind audition that, that I was able to do, um, redemption song there's a lot of a lot of messages in, in that song right that can be taken a lot of different ways but the the only message that that I wanted to portray and I wanted to make sure that was clear when I was singing the song was that on behalf of of all people who has ever gone through any type of struggles specifically for native people you know um, and we know the struggles that we've been through um, that the key to that to moving forward from that and from all of that trauma and from anything you've been through is the lyrics of the song, yeah? To emancipate yourself from that mental slavery. Um, and once we do that, we can move forward, you know? Once we do that, we can continue to, to build ourselves up as Native people, you know? In whatever part of the country that you're in or whatever part of this world that you're in, um, that we have a place here um, and that we're gonna continue to, to be noticed and be here, you know, especially in our homelands. I loved that you used your big moment to uplift Native people. Were you surprised by the reaction of the judges? I would say that I, I was a little surprised by, by their reaction for sure. But it, it wasn't something foreign to me um, coming from Hawaii. You know, as a Native Hawaiian myself, being surrounded by other Native Hawaiians, uh, proud Native Hawaiians, it wasn't something foreign to me, but it definitely was something surprising to, to get a reaction from other people um, in that way. Speaking about folks back home, what has been the reaction of those in your community? Um, there's been there's been a, a ton of, of good, um, positive comments, a lot a lot of love, you know, a lot of pride, you know, coming from um, our community, especially being able to represent them. You know, um, I had this conversation with my with my mom the other day that uh, people from our community feel like they're a part of this journey too. You know, they feel like this is this is also their journey as well. And that that really is what makes this whole thing special is being able to, to represent, right? Um, all native people, right? But also bring them on this journey of positivity, you know, and share that positivity and love with the world. Kamale, as your journey on The Voice continues, is there a particular moment that you really wanna share with the world? I, I feel like that moment happened already during the battle rounds when we were able to sing Israel Kamako Vivo Ole's version of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And um, not a lot of people know it, but if you're from Hawaii, you know that that, that track and that man, Israel, is the soundtrack of Hawaii, you know. And it that was a, a highlight moment for me um, to be able to sing that song on this platform. And everyone from Hawaii instantly knowing what version it was from, you know, whose version it really was. And a lot of people from Hawaii don't know the original version, you know. we A lot of us grew up listening to Israel's version. So that was definitely a moment um, and a highlight for me uh, throughout this experience. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for part two of my conversation with Kamale Kava'a. We'll talk all about perpetuating Hawaiian culture from language to the biggest hula festival in the world. We'll be right back.
is here to share all about an Indigenous-led library center that is getting a major boost. Alex Soto is the director of the Labriola National American Indian Data Center located at Arizona State University. It is a space where students and community members can celebrate scholarship and creative writing by Indigenous people. Alex, welcome back to the show. Hello, it's good to be here. Nice to see you again. So April 3rd is a date that I'm sure has been marked on your calendar for some time, but yes. tell us why. It's because finally with the, our Indigenous Library at uh, ASU, uh, the Labriola National American Indian Data Center, this is uh, really a monumental period to start our new era because when I came in as director some two years ago, two and a half years ago, our center was in the process of being um, reestablished and now we're here. And so to see the growth in that time with our staff and our physical space and of course working with community is very awesome to see. So You're having this huge grand opening celebration. Tell our viewers a little bit about what they could expect if they were to attend. So for the uh, agenda we'll say throughout the day, it's a really open house uh, environment vibe, uh, very starting at three o'clock for the community. Um, from that point, you'll be able to have uh, snacks provided by Res Eatery, which is a Diné uh, caterer that we work with here at uh, ASU, and also B DJs and music. So we'll have DJ Reflection, who's also Diné. He'll be spinning music from three to about six or so. And then around six, uh, we'll transition to another meal prepared, uh, prepared by Res Eatery. So we'll have, a, we'll say finger food at that point, but also have a performance from One Way Sky, which is an alternative band out of the Hill River Indian community. I so. love One Way Sky. I saw them recently at the Setevaki Museum and yes. they were stellar and amazing. Yes. Um, ahead of that, however, on Saturday, so just in a couple of days, you're having um, another event. And mm -hmm. actually tell us about that and why it's important to hold. So in addition to this getting to this point of having a grand opening um, with a library, the work we do at Labriola, especially within the lens of indigenous librarianship and being rooted from our home communities, in my case, Don Altham, we recognize the importance to um, have that a spiritual cultural foundation. So being that we're on Altham land and myself as Don Altham, um, we wanted to set it off right with the prayer run to be able to you know, recognize the efforts we've done up to this point to get to where we're at. Uh, and not really, not even just my time as director, but in general, the center this past 30 years, but also to recognize it's the community, right, that made this happen. And so in light of that, we, we wanted to honor that um, intention through a prayer, which is our prayer run, which is about 34 miles. Uh, starting from Red Mountain, which is located on the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, which will make its way through Scottsdale and eventually cut south to uh, the Tempe campus, where we'll be able to go into the library to do what we got to do uh, to you know, cleanse the library, the, the Labriola, and, and a blessing, we'll say, and then from there embark to South Mountain to close out the run. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, why we're doing it, and also just, you know, being healthy and active and, you know, all those other things in our communities, so, yeah. I want to make sure for our viewers who might be learning about the Labriola Center for the first time, I want to make sure that they understand um, its role and purpose for Native students, academics, and allies in the ASU community. So tell us about that. Well, in short, you know, we're an Indigenous-led library within the ASU library system. And I say that because uh, we're very unique in that sense to have one Indigenous staff, such as myself and our team, which at this point consists of six full-time uh, funded, uh, permanently funded employees. And so out of that, that says a lot to the commitment to ASU as far as having Native people in spaces like libraries that were never meant for us, we'll say historically, to be able to share or access our information from an Indigenous perspective. And so our role is to mediate, you know, or to share that information from a culturally appropriate way, uh, working with researchers, working with students of all levels, working with community, and also knowing that it links to uh, engagements and activities like this run and how we see information as sacred, right, in terms of how we uh, share it, how we uh, curate it, how we preserve it. And so to us with this run, it kind of just shows those protocols are embedded you know, from not just the, the library side, but also the run, but also in general, everything we do at the library. And so, uh, yeah, we're, we're a resource for the, the library system as a whole and ASU as a whole. It's just that, yeah, to have native people, it's very unique because really only our, our research university at this level to have an all indigenous staff and a space of this size, which is about 6,000 square feet. 
Speaking of the space, it existed before this grand opening. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the revamps and exactly the hard work that had to go in behind the scenes to make this project happen. Yeah, so, you know, I'll just say that in terms of the progress to get here, um, you know, it's a, really a conversation with, you know, the community in terms of the ASU Native community and ASU as a whole. And, you know, institutions, you know, uh, especially in this time, are trying their best to, you know, make pathways and inclusion uh, important, you know, in their strategic priorities. And I feel with Labriola, it was an opportunity to show that. Um, I'll just say, you know, things maybe didn't align initially that as the community wanted it, the Labriola to be at one point. But just through uh, advocacy, through this community support from alum, uh, students, and just overall tribes, it just uh, really amounted to what we're doing now. And so, although I'm the director and, in that sense, the face here in this interview, you know, it's really my team, you know, and in working with our community um, with values of kinship centered, you know, to recognize that we're not just here to help you as a library user or a patron, right? We're here to help you as our relatives, right? Extended family in that sense, because we want to help you succeed with having information at the forefront to help you do your papers or do your research or anything with data sovereignty and all these larger academic uh, you know uh, terms and so so yeah it's been a lot you know to share that to leadership but luckily we do have a large ASU native community right we have over uh, 4,000 native students we have 70 plus native faculty uh, various you know prominent programs you know at ASU so the foundation's there and it's just a matter of course asserting ourselves in that sovereignty to say hey this is what we need if we have all these students it makes sense to have a library and to have space of this size and the support to sustain it beyond uh, this point, so. As the director of the Labriola Center, in entering this new era, era what excites you the most? The opportunity just to show the importance of tribal libraries and indigenous libraries as a whole is that I feel that within the larger, you know, Indian education movement for the past, you know, hundred, really hundreds of years, depending where you start, that librarians were maybe not, uh, native librarians were not maybe viewed within that conversation. But if you look back, even as far as 1978, with Vine Deloria Jr. had a paper uh, he presented to the White House at the time called The Right to Know. And The Right to Know basically was a conference proceeding stating that uh, in order for natives to have, uh, you know, education that supports our ways of knowing, libraries are in that conversation. And so that's where a lot of the funding from tribal libraries was established back around then. And now to the point where we have, you know, support at ASU, it just shows that librarianship and having indigenous people to uh, share the, your, you know, our resources, our books, our archives is important to our researchers, our scholars. And that's just at higher ed. The same thing could be said for K for 12. So yeah, I think librarians uh, freaking are awesome. That's why I'm a librarian. <laughs> uh, but also to note, yeah, like I think it's really an opportunity to show that potential working with our, our partners across campus and really the, the in Arizona, you know, to show, hey, like this is uh, what it can look like. And, you know, we can give you some ideas and framework to build out of that, so. Well, Alex, I hope that your event goes very wonderfully and smooth. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So. Up, Jidge. Up, Jidge. I'll see you again. Up, means again. Up judge is I'll see you again because there is no such thing as goodbye in the Passamaquoddy language. Hotter summers, longer pollen seasons, and record rainfalls. These changing patterns are putting our health and the health of those we love at risk. So communities around the country are taking steps to prepare. State, local, and tribal health officials are using the Building Resilience Against Climate Effects framework developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, called BRACE for short. The five-step process is used to develop strategies and programs that help communities prepare a coordinated community response to the health effects of a changing climate. Step one is identifying what climate effects are relevant locally how those might lead to new or expanded health threats, and who is most at risk. The next step is to calculate expected impacts on the local population, and then rank the severity of each threat. This is called projecting the disease burden. What it does is it helps health officials tackle the worst risks first. Step three is to identify ways the community can intervene to prevent or reduce health effects. For example, health officials who are expecting more high heat days might consider if it would be more effective to open community cooling centers 
or to collaborate on housing and development plans to protect vulnerable residents. Then in step four, health officials work with other community sectors to develop and implement their plan. For example, health officials may work with city planners to reduce the impact of urban heat islands or with broadcast meteorologists to alert people to prepare for extreme weather. Step five is evaluation. Health officials assess the success of their adaptation plans and gather lessons learned to apply for future activities. These five steps in the BRACE framework are designed to be flexible and responsive to local needs. Any community, whether urban, suburban, rural, or tribal, can use BRACE to prepare for the local health impacts of a changing climate. To learn more, visit cdc.gov forward slash climate and health. March is Women's History Month to celebrate the women who have made a difference in our lives and in the lives of their Native nations. Here's an encore presentation of an interview from our archives. Last year, the national magazine Art Review named its top 50 most influential people in art, and that list includes an Indigenous woman. ICT Shirley Snavy has this conversation with Candace Hopkins. You were listed as one of the art review people to watch and people to admire and look at. And um, I'm just really pleased and honored that you're on the show and congratulations. What does this mean to you? We're gaining greater recognition for the incredible work that Native people make across Turtle Island, uh, particularly in the field that I work in, which is contemporary art. And I honestly feel that this recognition is long overdue. So um, it's really not about me. It's yeah, I try to bring my community with me in every project that I do. So I think it's a broader recognition than that. Forge Project is located in Taconic, New York. It started in 2021 and uh, really as a social justice project. We have a fellowship where we host um, six cultural workers annually for a year. Applications will be open for that in uh, early January. Um, and people come and they spend up to three weeks at Forge. At Forge is on a 38-acre campus and in two buildings designed by the renowned um, artist and activist Ai Weiwei. And we do a lot of programs. One that are specific and centering, you know, only Native people, others that are public programs. We have um, an outdoor land and learning kitchen, for example. We just did an elderberry making workshop. But a big part of what I do there too as chief curator is we have a lending art collection as well. We have now, uh, we are custodians of 177 works. We're actively collecting. And the point of that collection is for it to be lent out, whether it's to a tribal museum, or, for example, to a museum in Germany or across uh, Turtle Island. And part of that is that we feel like this collection should be part of the public good. We want it to be um, really an excess of knowledge building. We focus on the work of living Native artists. And we put a lot of emphasis actually in New York City, even though we're two hours north, it's because a lot of the major museums in New York, with a few exceptions, haven't really hosted a lot of work by native contemporary artists so we use that as an opportunity to show in a, in a way to show what they've been missing we are on mohicaniac land uh so mohican people and um this is you know it's a very it's a bit of a different situation for me i'm originally from carcross yukon in northern canada my colleague sarah bascara dilly is chumash and she runs uh indigenous programs where we are we really recognize ourselves as guests on lands where Native people have been really displaced. So a uh, majority of um, Mohican people now live in, in Wisconsin, near Bowler, Wisconsin, Stock Rouge, Muncie community. And they were displaced a total of eight, eight times, you know, starting in the 1700s. So part of what Forge is, um, you know, one of our commitments is to really think about Indigenous placemaking. How do we reduce barriers to access for people's homeland, especially in an area, you know, just north of New York City, which has become quite heavily gentrified. So there are, you know, barriers to access. So we have a program where we work together and we have a, a MOU with Stockbridge Muncie community. 
because we see this as a very important diplomatic relationship. And I think, you know, not just for native led organizations, but any cultural institution, you know, if they have a land acknowledgement, they should be working with real relations that have, you know, tangible results and accountability on both sides. So we're trying to model that as well at Forge. So Candace, what's coming up next for you? Uh, we're working on a big book and that's the reader that's coming out of the exhibition Indian Theater. And it's looking at the history of native visual sovereignty since 1969, you know, starting with um, important work that was done at the Institute of American Indian Arts, but really showing how our voices have shaped this particular movement. And this will be a book that will be broadly available. And we hope that it'll be a valuable tool, particularly for um, post-secondary institutions where um, there's not always a lot of access to these materials. So I think one of the things that we're doing at Forge is really thinking about how publishing can change that and create more access. I appreciate you being here, Candace Hopkins. Yeah. Thank you, Shirley. It was, it was a real pleasure. That is a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.